Hi, Marilyn. Nice to see you. Hi, Janaki. Thank you for having me. Let me introduce my guest today. Marilyn Nomusa Nkomo is a master's student of conservation biology at the University of Cape Town, South Africa. She studied vultures and southern ground hornbills in Zimbabwe and now mentors a youth birding club. Marilyn wrote two articles that I recommend to everyone who's into wildlife conservation called The Achilles Heel of Conservation and the Tale of the Past and Present. After I read these two articles, I read many more of her writings and was finally able to track her down. I wanted to know more about her experiences and uh, ask her what she thought could be done to change things. And Marilyn graciously agreed to be interviewed. Thanks so much, Marilyn. Let me ask, uh, start by asking you, who or what is the greatest love of your life? <laughs> um, raptors are the greatest love of my life. Uh, birds of prey, they give me so much peace and calm. They give me the greatest sense of recreation and uh, inspiration. So um, I love my family, I love everybody, but personally, yeah, raptors, raptors give me serenity and purpose and passion. Yeah, I'm happiest when I've seen a bird of prey. <laughs> okay, what talent would you most like to have? Um, maybe because I can't do it. I wish I could swim. I wish I could dive uh, because I feel that part of uh, nature is, is, is um, sold off for me so that's a skill or talent I wish I, I had I wish I could swim and dive <laughs> go deep sea diving that's the talent I wish I had okay what is your idea of perfect happiness wow perfect happiness uh, a lot of things are important for me so equality um, I care about a lot of causes. So my idea of perfect happiness is quite complex. It's a, a fair and just world uh, where everybody um, is recognized for what they can uh, contribute to society, where everybody has a fair and equal chance, um, where nature is respected and um, used sustainably, where the air is clean and uh, yeah, where well, the birds are not, you know, in trouble and, and so on. So yeah, my idea of a perfect world and happiness is complicated, but I'm sure a lot of people share in my 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 view and my wish. Yeah, that's a perfect segue into the interview. In one of the articles, you say, "quote In my five years of life, I was convinced there was nothing to love about being African or black." And in the same article, you said you wanted to be white when you grew up. Do you think black Africans have internalized racism? Um, yeah, I do think a lot of Africans have internalized racism. Um, they've accepted the norm or the, the, the belief of uh, white superiority and white culture being superior. And this manifests itself in so many ways in terms of either cultural hate. A lot of um, Africans have um, hate towards their own culture or look down upon their uh, own way of doing things. And so many, uh, in so many ways from how we, we dress and view how our culture dresses used to dress, uh, how women uh, adorn their hair and treat their hair, how people's perceptions about skin color are, how they have preference for lighter skin tones, how even just in conversation, you know, literal phrases uh, about white being better, um, white being intelligence, white being rich wealth and, and riches, 
are very commonplace in, 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 in African culture, even in Zimbabwe. At times with even bad governance, like uh, you'd know with Zimbabwe, most people would know with Zimbabwe, you'd hear all the people saying, ah, oh, colonization was better than what we're having now, you know. So there exists a lot of um, internalized racism across the board, across society and yeah, most fears of life. And it's really sad. You wrote, quote, unlike Western culture where all stories used to ignite a child's imagination center around kings, queens, princes, and princesses, African folklore is mainly centered on wildlife. Can you give us an example of one? Yeah, African folklore, all the stories I grew up uh, to as a child were about wildlife, um, stories that taught you how to be culturally, how to re be respectful, where all uh, played out between a rabbit or a hare or a lion. Sometimes they would say all the animals, once upon a time, all the animals of the world, and you try to imagine all the animals of the world together. But my my best memory is uh, is is when my first tooth uh, fell, and uh, in order for m my teeth to grow back, my mother taught taught me a song and told me I had to sing the song and throw my tooth over the roof, and uh, the song is to uh, what we call the yellow billed kite. And uh, you basically, as a child, learn the song. It's a long song, but you learn the, the, the short version that asks uh, the yellow-billed kite to take your ugly tooth and give you its beautiful tooth. Maybe it was a joke on the children because the yellow-billed kite has got a yellow bill <laughs> and nobody wants <laughs> a yellow hooked tooth. But... Um, if this had been continued, I tried to continue it with my nephew and teach him the song, which took a bit of work and teaching him how to throw high. Yes, and it's, I feel like it's a rite of passage for a child um, and it ignites curiosity as to what this bird is, what its life is, you know. Can you so sing that's my, my <laughs> Um I'll sing a short, uh, shorter one for you. It says, Mzwazwa, Mzwazwa, Mzwazwa ganko viyo, Tati zinyolam, Ungi pela kwe dish, Kri, kri, kri. Then you throw it over the roof, and it has, you have to throw high enough so that the bird can see it as it flies around and take it, and then if it likes and approves of your, your melody, your tooth is going to grow back beautiful and... <laughs> <laughs> and strong <laughs> so yeah it was a lot of pressure because you, you you had a gap uh in your mouth and you really wanted the gap closed so you'd sing <laughs> so is that how you developed an interest in birds actually i've i i had interest in birds i tried to trap birds with my sisters to 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 have them as a pet or something I, uh, they were there were boys in my township who would go out and catch um, a plant we used to call inofi and uh, after boiling it it would be like glue and they would um, wind it around sticks to try and make a perching trap. Uh, we tried to to do bait with starch uh, and and grain, but we were never successful and when I think of how young I was. Uh, and, and in comparison to children today, I, I just, <laughs> I understand why we failed so much. But afterwards, I was preoccupied with trying to be a dermatologist once, be a doctor once, be a lawyer at some point. And when I did start to study wildlife, I was obsessed with wild dogs. I, I, was, I was certain I was going to be a kind of a biologist. I loved wild dogs and obsessed about them so <laughs> birds were not my first choice they were not even in the forefront of my mind at all <laughs> so what caused the switch how did you switch from wild dogs to birds <laughs> um this this story actually shows how quickly <laughs> or, or how 
um, quickly I can change my my loves and commitment and pour myself into something new and and adapt. So we were going for the first ever trip in my life to a national park, and it was a field trip uh, in my second year of university. And to the national park, which is the biggest in Zimbabwe, Wangi National Park, we were due to stop at a, a, a sanctuary called Painted Dog Conservation, which was for wild dogs. And during that time, in 2014, we were preparing ourselves for internship year, the whole of third year, was supposed to be an internship. So I really wanted to impress this sanctuary with my love and knowledge of painted dogs so they would accept me. But we left for our trip too late and it was at night when we drove past painted dog conservation. So we started our, our work and trip in the national park. And I was put in a group that was supposed to observe and document the birds in the national park. Naturally, I was just, oh, why, why? I never looked at birds. And I had these binoculars for the first time, very old pieces of, of old lenses that I had to use and I was frustrated. But I realized that when other people were looking for lions and looking for this and elephants, I could see even the tiniest things flying very far away. I was like, oh, maybe I'm good at this. <laughs> and our list kept growing, our list kept growing. And then our lecturer who was leading us lent me his Canon image stabilizing binoculars. And I looked through and saw my very first bird. He had a field side and taught me, look at the legs. What boots are they wearing? What color boots are they wearing? What lipstick are they wearing? What jacket are they, you know? And I identified on my own my first bird, which was the emerald spotted wood dove. I saw so many birds that day, so many raptors that day, and I fell in love and I was, con well, not convinced yet, but I knew I wanted a pair of binoculars. And on our way back, it was day and we stopped by the, uh, the, the, the painted dog uh, sanctuary and I impressed them. And they told the lecturer to ask me if I'd like to be an intern there. And something in me just said, I'm not sure. Tell them I'll decide. <laughs> so afterwards, I could see birds. I could hear birds. And I was certain I wanted to study birds. I was just in love with birds. <laughs> so was there a defining moment when you said to yourself, this is what I want to do with my life? So the defining moment actually came a while later because I was so overwhelmed for a long time, for about a year since I started my studies in wildlife, I was convinced I wanted to study wild dogs and I had arrived at something, but now I just liked birds. Which bird? Which group of birds? Um, you know, so... I told myself, maybe I will intern at a zoo and then I'll find which, which type of science in birds I, I like. But that failed and I ended up interning at a, a vulture rehabilitation center. And naturally I thought, ah, oh, vultures of all birds. But over there, I grew so much and I, I found my purpose and my passion. I saw the most raptors I, I would have never seen where I come from, where in terms of uh, exposure to, to, to wild spaces. And that was a defining moment. I had the hardest time uh, adapting to where I was, but when I saw a bird um, convulsing from and seizing from poisoning, you know, some birds came poisoned with lead poisoning and they'll be paralyzed. Some birds would have seizures from, from, from poisonings. And when I looked at that bird, I was, I was sure that this is what I want to do. This is, I want to help these birds. I want to educate people about these birds. So yeah, I had struggled a lot that year. I'd asked myself, maybe I should leave this and just do a teaching diploma. I would totally excel at that because this is so hard. But when I saw that bird that day through the cage, it was seizing and couldn't stand up properly. 
I told myself, this is what I want to do. I could get beaten by a vulture and be scratched by some talons <laughs> on the way. But yeah, I'll never forget oh. that day. <laughs> is poisoning a big threat to vultures in uh, Zimbabwe? Or because in India, we've had a massive decline in vultures because of this drug that they use in uh, livestock. Yeah, so I, I, I studied the diclofenic situation a lot because it, it, it was one of the fears we had about African vultures and the center I was volunteering at was also working very hard with the University of Pretoria to, to find alternatives to, to non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs that wouldn't be um, deadly and toxic to, to vultures. But the kind of poisoning that is happening here is more sad because um, there's indirect poisoning and direct poisoning. So indirect poisoning is when people are targeting pest animals like jackals and caracal or lions that are killing their livestock. And because vultures have such good sight, they end up seeing this, this, um, this bait that is meant for carnivores. And carnivores themselves are not efficient uh, at cleaning out carcasses. So even if the carnivore is, is, is killed from the poison, there'll be a lot left over for birds of prey to, to eat. And, ber and birds, uh, especially vultures, will feed um, in large groups. The most um, uh, popular species, species of vulture we have is the African white bag vulture and uh, it feeds it can you can find 200 on a carcass and in that single sitting they all die uh, but one of the most worrying concern uh, concerning activities now is sentinel poisoning uh, poachers poaching uh, elephants will lace the carcass with usually aldicap or it's called terminic which they call two-step literally meaning two steps and you're dead so they want the birds to come down and not fly up again because um, in national parks, which are short staffed really, game rangers depend a lot on vultures to see if anything has died, drive over there and check out if there's been any poaching activity. So it's very sad. Last year, the last biggest uh, poisoning event I remember is when I was in Botswana and it happened in Botswana, over 500 birds were killed on an elephant carcass. It's, it's terrible, it's unsustainable, it's, it's sad. So uh, at this time, are you uh, studying in a college? When this is happening, I'm, when you first went to the Vulture Rehabilitation Center? When I first went to the Vulture Rehabilitation Center, I was an intern. Um, I was also registered with my university because our degree program requires your third year to be fully in the field, uh, uh, choosing a direction, a career path, and also making networks, trying to get your, your thesis um, research, you know? So yeah, at this time I was part working, learning how an organization runs, uh, learning how to interact with people in an organization, but also trying to apply it to my studies and bring home or bring back to my fourth year, my final year, a research project and experience from the field. So you're studying wildlife biology for your degree, your graduate degree? So my undergraduate degree was in forest resources and wildlife management. And my master's now is in conservation biology with the University of Cape Town. Right. So when you chose the, to study um, forestry, was that, uh, where you, did you have, where, did your family and friends think you were doing the right thing or did they think you were choosing a, career path that's not going to give you a livelihood or it's the white thing to do how does it fit in culturally yeah for for a very long time my um family well my family caught on earlier because they i'm i'm the eldest daughter i'm headstrong 
um, they they've always believed in me and uh, they think if I if they believe quickly in something I believe in and then they they try to 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 understand but for a long time my friends my close friends and friends and colleagues uh, in my peers would think oh, it's such a white thing oh you and your white people sometimes they would joke on my uh, statuses and posts ah, you're carrying snakes, you're now a witch, ah, you're doing white people things. And uh, yeah, for, for a long time, um, but a lot of people that know me now are very curious and want to know, and they know I don't like those jokes anymore, but I don't really mind them because it's an opportunity to educate. My father did ask me when I asked him to buy me binoculars, um, he he's, he's the very provider type of father and will get you what you need as long as it's for school. So he asked me after I asked him to buy me binoculars, he said, are you sure you're going to get a job in this field you're in? And I said, honestly, daddy, no, I, I'm not sure. <laughs> and then he said, okay, I'll buy you those binoculars. And that to me was very powerful because he thought, um, so these binoculars will give you a better chance at what you want. So I'll get them for you. And he got me binoculars and a camera. And this, this was, this was uh, a big deal because he himself has ne had never had binoculars. We don't have manufacturers of binoculars in Zimbabwe. He had to phone a friend in England and pay in pounds for those, which was very expensive for that camera and those binoculars. And, in care did, but because because uh, it was going to give me a better chance at what I was doing, he said, I'll get them for you. <laughs> so over the years, I've created seminars to educate people. I've traveled for conferences. I've done so many things. And my family has shown up to all my events with their friends, their workmates, with anybody who will come my father would drive, my, my seminars would be in the evenings so that most people can come after work. And my father would drive anybody back to their home in his van. Um, you know, my mother would help with, with, with uh, if there was food being served, my mother would bring her, her plates her, her, from, her, from her collection. She would bring her crockery and everything to help with my, my events. If I was traveling on, on conferences, they would gather up some money. You will eat something on the way. So my family has been very supportive, very, very supportive. Yeah, it sounds it. So what do you mean when you say it is harder to be a black person in conservation? Is it because you're a woman? Like what are the hurdles facing young black Africans who want to volunteer in wildlife organizations it's it is harder being black and in conservation because first obviously um there's issues of finances and although a lot of people live in poverty um which really prohibits them to 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 enter many fields um even medium even middle class people have have challenges with conservation degrees are expensive and you cannot be in them without a scholarship i've been trying to get into my program for uh, some time and i had to 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 do a lot of things so i could qualify for for scholarships lose a lot of time which could have been time for work you know trying to volunteer and most volunteer programs um, are unpaid so um, you you have to devote time away from from what you could what could be gainful employment in other sectors and be a volunteer. Um, most uh, events where you can boost your CV or get networks, you know, get seen by people that can advance your career. Most of those uh, uh, events are expensive to get into. The first conference event I went to cost over 2,000 rands. And at the time that was over about 200 US dollars. And that's a lot of money for, for, for a black person, uh, an African person, if I can say. And um, it excludes, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, it becomes exclusionary. 
and the equipment you need to have, uh, the places you'll need to go. So whilst some, many people will have a passion and, and want to, to be in conservation, most of us, I myself included, have responsibilities to, to taking care of our family. I have to help my parents with, with, um, with, with uh, financial responsibilities. I'm a, an eldest sister, I've got siblings. I have to help out in their tuition and not and so on. So um, it's different for a black person uh, pursuing conservation. You cannot live for just yourself. You know, you've got financial responsibilities and obligations. So being in a field that is that does not guarantee you job security and stability is 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 harder really. And for women, you had asked about women. Women will also have the added challenge of uh, that this is a male dominated industry and um, you have to prove, even though it's not spoken, you have to prove that you can do it 30 days of the, of the month. You can be present, you can uh, be calm, you can uh, do as, as good as the men would do. And there's also um, issues of marriage, when to marry, when to have children, if you can be able to come back into the field and have a relevant career, juggling being a woman, you know, um, and, and being a wildlife biologist can be a challenge for, for, for other women. So I've met a lot of women in, in conservation in my life that felt like to have a meaningful career, they had to put off a lot of things. Some women even say, no, I don't want to have children anymore. Or no, uh, marriage doesn't matter. But that's what comes with being a woman in, in conservation. It's kind of like you can't have it all, mm. you know? Yeah. yeah. So what is it about the field of wildlife conservation that alienates Black people? Why does it uh, seem like such a white preoccupation in Africa? So, I mean, to start, to start with, um, conservation began as um, a really colonial enterprise, if I can say, because it was, uh, if, I would, if I would give Zimbabwe as a, an example, um, the, the nat our first national parks were really wasteland land that wasn't good for agriculture and so on. So wildlife was moved there and reserves, which we call now uh, fortress conservation would be gun, where there would be a warden with a gun excluding people so that the elites, the white elites could hunt there and recreate there. So the model has really prevailed in most places, although uh, in the 90s and 80s, uh, when most um, colonies were free and they, they were starting out uh, as countries, liberated countries, they tried to involve communities that had been displaced with all this land grabbing and um, creation of reserves and parks. So some places have included communities, have tried to create models of community-based management, but um, Yes, there's been that exclusion. So it, the field became so elitist, um, only the elites could access it. Sometimes it would be private game reserves that are white owned. So it was harder it, uh, pr uh, previously to penetrate the field. Um, and presently the job security is a big concern because most black people, like I said, cannot afford to still be 30 years old and unemployed and gainfully employed, you know? So there's, there's been historic exclusion and it's continued with the systems in place that disadvantage people of color, I mean, even globally, that disadvantage people of color disproportionately. And that makes it not very welcoming or difficult to be in. Right. So how did you uh, choose to disregard all that history and enter this field? Well, when I was uh, in high school, I, 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 I had this conviction in my faith as a Christian that 
um, I had responsibility to be a steward of the planet because God created it and so on and so forth. And I loved nature. I loved um, wildlife. And my father as well had been buying us uh, these old books that people would put out on the street. And he kept buying us a lot of scientific nature books. So he bought us a big book on gorillas. He bought us a, a, a a book called What Flower Is That? It was pictures and scientific names. And I'd always just dig in and, 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 and read and look for, 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 for flowers. So I, I started collecting wild plants. I started, um, yes, I started obsessing about nature and loving uh, natural spaces and things. So I, I, I never thought of it in terms of color, in terms of I would be disadvantaged as a black person or it's a white people thing. And when I did, I was defiant. I was like, that's what I'm going to do either way. So for a long time, yes, I, 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 I felt I could yeah, challenge the stereotype and follow what my heart wanted. Because also personally, I have a character flaw that if I'm, if it doesn't excite me, if I'm not passionate about it, I will struggle. I will struggle to even do it for a day. So yeah, for me, it was a calling and a duty. And I felt my dreams are my dreams. If I have them, it means I have to pursue them. <laughs> So going back to what you said earlier about how some of the national parks were possibly uh, former communal lands that were taken away from indigenous communities to create uh, national parks, I would imagine that created a lot of distrust and suspicion. So how do we do conservation without correcting those past injustices? How do we bridge um, how do we bring conservation to communities in situations like that? I think, I think the first thing, and um, some organizations have started uh, looking at conservation in this uh, view. The first thing is to stop in thinking that people are an enemy of uh, the wildlife because most, uh, conservation projects and programs have painted local people as the problem, uh, as the poachers, as, you know. So the first thing as conservation is that need that we need to do is, is to get community buy-in, to get communities to, to accept that this is their national park. This is, you know, because with the putting up of fences and prohibitions and punishments, they were excluded first from land that was their own, now from, from wildlife that they bore in their synonyms, in their totems, wildlife they had beliefs in, wildlife they, they ate from, you know, forests that were safety nets for them. So for many generations, a lot of people have believed that that part of the country or that part of their neighborhood in terms of the landscape is not theirs it belongs to the government or, or the white people that go there and afford to go there. So it, it takes for conservation managers to come down to the level of the people, uh, get buy-in, get their ideas and know their needs and try to make plans and strategies that have a win-win uh, solution for communities Yes, because you find that most of our national parks are in rural areas where there is rampant poverty and there's very nice concessionaires inside the parks with very expensive lodges and the richest people in the world coming to visit. But right outside this resource that's making so much money for the country, people are living in abject poverty. They're not allowed to, to hunt or eat uh, from the park. You know, they are raided by these animals in their crops or killed by the lions and so on. So I think we need to get community buy-in and, and involvement in sustainability uh, in use. Yeah, just equitable use. Right. So what was the trigger that led you to write this article called The Oculus Heal of Conservation? 
So there were, there were really many triggers. My writing process is I spend weeks having conversations with myself, having uh, phrases and pieces of the article coming together in my mind to a point I feel literally overloaded <laughs> and I can't concentrate on anything until I write. So I will spit it out and in a few hours I'll have the article and in one or two weeks um, my friend has helped me uh, you know assess it for 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 emotion and uh, grammar areas and it's posted so it took a while uh, I wouldn't say I was triggered by the Black Lives Matter movement because I've been thinking about it a long time I I was triggered really um, by the situation I found myself in in conservation thinking uh, constantly thinking about what business idea I will need to create to sustain myself if I still continued in conservation. I felt, oh, I, th I think that um, I, 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 if I'm to get a job, I would maybe need to have other side enterprises that could support me and, and give me what I need to, to sustain myself. And, and it was very stressful because I, am, I have ideas and all, but I'm not a business-minded person. I, I'm not good with money and economics, but that's where most people find themselves. You have to have a side hustle to, 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 to fuel your passion and sustain your life. I, I felt a lot of anguish because I was doing everything I could, but still, I wasn't going to get where I wanted to get in the time I wanted to get compared to my peers. And when COVID-19 also hit, a lot of scientists were flying back home all over the world. A lot of people couldn't fly to their, um, to their field stations and so on. And I was wondering, this is unsustainable. We have a world where local scientists do not have as much input in their local areas. And if a pandemic hits, there's nobody to, to continue the conservation. There's nobody reasonable or, or well-placed to continue this conservation because everybody's flown home or can't fly to their field station. So yes, I, I got thinking about, about it. And um, of course, the, the situations that were happening in June, that were playing out in June with Black Lives Matter, um, Black uh, Birders Week, and also an article that was written by UCT professor about why black students uh, do not pursue conservation and zoology degrees. So yes, that's where my mind was at. That prompted me to write the Achilles heel of conservation. It was just telling a story, uh, nothing researched, just telling my life story, my friends' life stories, yeah. What has the reaction been so far to that? essay? The reaction has been phenomenal. It's, it's been great. I have written things before and I'm always, I'm always very anxious about my writing because I, I never used to think of myself as a writer. Um, so I, I had anxiety about how is this going to be received and in the first hours of publishing I literally had to to, to, to sleep, to, to stop stressing about how it would be received. <laughs> but the reaction has been great. A lot of people, for example, you as well, have, have sought me out and wanted to have the conversation. A lot of people feel they'd accepted that it's the status quo and that's how their lives would be, people in, on my side of the reality. And some people have come forward and said, I've benefited from this situation and it's great to see your side of view and I would like to be part of the solution. So it's, it's been phenomenal. I thought it would be controversial and a lot of noise, but even people on the other camp that is uh, privileged in this field realize it and um, want to have the conversation and find solutions. So yeah, it's been phenomenal. So who are the um, black conservation biologists whom you look up to? Well, I have a few 
I have a few ladies actually that I look up to. The first is a lady called Josephine Mundava. Uh, Josephine was my lecturer in my undergraduate studies and uh, literally the first ornithologist I know. Um, so yes, she is almost done with her PhD. She's lecturing, she does field work and she's a mother and a wife, you know. Um, and she she was my first Mrs. Miss Mundava to me as a lecturer, till she became Josephine as a friend. So she she has been on my side since I was an undergraduate, my supervisor for my thesis, and and now she's my my friend. And yes, so another one would be for Zaima Simbo. She works for BirdLife Zimbabwe. We met when I was in my internship year. And she helped me a lot with my applications for grants, my writing, um, and, and just helping me navigate the, 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 the landscape of, you know, networking. Another one is Mo Angels, Dr. Mo Angels Visa. I met her recently and she's a carnival biologist. She's a, she studies lions and human and wildlife conflict in Zimbabwe. She, yeah, she's phenomenal. She even gave a TED talk recently, uh, last year, about these issues, about um, being a black woman in conservation. So yeah, those are the women I look up to in, in wildlife conservation. Still trying to think of men, <laughs> <laughs> black, black men, but yeah, my, my list is of black women. <laughs> That's great. So there's a question from the United States. Have you called out racial or gender barriers without burning bridges or being seen as a troublemaker? Or has your message been discredited in any way? Um, maybe it's a difficult time for people to, 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 to um, voice out um, opinions um, that are seemingly contrary to those of black voices. But I, I do invite uh, people with different opinions from what I, I wrote and, and write about to, to, to engage and talk to me. Um, I haven't yet gotten any um, backlash or, 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 um, or any of that type of reaction. And I have worried that maybe uh, people are afraid to be caught on, on, on the wrong side of the history that's going on right now or being profiled as racist. Um, so I haven't yet received that type of reaction and I'd love to have those kind of con conversations because I wanted to start a conversation. I wanted a two-way conversation. But uh, yeah, I hope I've answered you completely. Yeah. I've answered all parts of the question. Well, I'm going to take it to the next generation. You mentor a youth birding club in Zimbabwe, but you are mm -hmm. in Cape Town, South Africa now. How do you mm -hmm. do the mentoring across international borders? WhatsApp. <laughs> so so I, I, I was privileged to, 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 to be able to organize this club before I left. So uh, from September last year, we were going out to the local park. I was teaching them skills to, to bird, uh, trying to rally up interest and, you know. So our first, on our first trip, really most people weren't engaging in the, you know, when you're trying to excite somebody about looking at birds. But now the club is going so strong. We're, we're trying to, to, to do small field excursions. Uh, they just had their recent trip uh, yesterday to one of the members' this neighborhood stream, and they were looking at water birds. Um, they've participated in the in the annual general meeting of bird life, which meant they had to to travel to to the capital city and meet other young people. You know, get more um inspiration from meeting other young people in, in 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 the country who are from different parts of the country who are birding so it's been growing it's been growing very strong and we are always in touch on whatsapp and now they've started their social media pages i'm so proud uh they're on twitter now and on facebook 
So yeah, they share their photos, they're passionate about their wildlife, they're asking questions on the WhatsApp. Yeah, it's, it's been great, it's great. I'm able to do it because most of them are my friends now and wouldn't have it any other way. I wish I would be there and around. <laughs> Okay, we're almost nearing the end. I just wanted you to read an excerpt from your article, please. So, in my short time in this field, I have been living between two worlds. My own, in which I have been socialized to believe the stereotype that loving nature is a white thing, which makes me a misfit among my people. The second one is my professional world, which believes black communities largely do not have an appreciation of the natural world and need to be taught. This offends me at varying levels. At times, I'm a foreigner in both worlds, and I hope I can build a bridge between them. Representation and inclusion are important for buy-in. Natural resource conservation in Africa will only be effective when everyone believes they are part of it and it will serve their collective interests. Thank you. Um, the final question, what are your future plans? Do you, are you going to go on to do a PhD? Are you going back to Zimbabwe? So I would hope to go on and do a PhD. I'm very interested in African philosophy and conservation, trying to rebuild those walls to um, African culture and conservation and tell those stories about the original beliefs and, and philosophy of, of Africans in conservation. So I may need to stick around longer or go to where I would be able to pursue this, but I, I want to contribute so much and impact to, 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 to uh, collective conservation leadership in Zimbabwe, uh, mobilizing conservation uh, conservationists to a common goal of natural resource management that is, um, you know, informs policy and, in, in, and, and, and sustainability for, for our country as a whole. So I have, I have a lot of plans <laughs> and I hope, yes, I hope I live long enough to, <laughs> to, to, well. to, to fulfill them. <laughs> yeah, all the best for your future endeavors and I'm sure we'll be in touch and we'll be seeing more of you. Thank you so much, Marilyn. Nice Thank talking you so much, to you. Oh, it was lovely talking to you. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>